Welcome to this episode of the Richard III podcast, part one of the Princes in the Tower controversy. Who said Richard III killed the Princes in the Tower? This isn't meant as just posturing, it's a legitimate question, and an interesting one. The far more interesting question, however, is who didn't say that he did it. This has been called the negative evidence, the conspicuous lack of positive evidence, and it is compelling. It is reported that the boys disappeared from public view late in the summer of 1483. This appears to be one of the few accepted, undisputed facts in the case. They went from being seen playing in the grounds of the tower, a royal palace as well as a prison then, to no longer being spotted. Even at this early stage, their fate was a matter of much gossip, and it was, in the main, reported as just that, rumour and gossip. King Richard attracted attention, but so too did the Duke of Buckingham, as contemporary chronicles show. The eldest prince, Edward, was also under the care of his physician, Dr John Argentine. The final glimpse of the boys within the historical record is the doctor's assertion that the young king, like a victim prepared for sacrifice, made daily confession because he thought that death was facing him. This is often taken to mean that Edward feared his uncle was planning to do away with him, but could equally mean that he feared a medical condition he was receiving treatment for may claim his life. It is telling that Edward fears for his life, but makes no mention of his younger brother Richard. This, for me, is where the historical record becomes most interesting, precisely because it is silent. It may be understandable that during the reign of King Richard III, he would prefer to have them forgotten, whatever their fate, but he held onto the throne for only two years. After the Battle of Bosworth, King Henry VII ushered in a new, tentative Tudor regime. Had Henry found the boys alive and well, he would have uncovered a real problem. He had sworn to marry their sister, Elizabeth of York, to unite the houses of York and Lancaster. In order to do this, he had to re-legitimise all of the children of King Edward IV. In doing so, he would hand the strongest claim to the throne in the kingdom to Edward if he was still alive, and Richard if he had survived his brother. Much of Edward IV's loyal support, which Henry had co-opted against Richard III, would most likely have returned their might to their former master's heir. It would therefore be in Henry's best interest for them not to be found alive. Upon taking the throne, Henry VII never once laid the blame for the death of the princes at King Richard's feet. In fact, he never laid the blame at anyone's feet. He never said an official word about them. It would have been so easy for him to state that they were dead, King Richard had done it, and now Henry had avenged that evil deed. Odd, then, that he should choose to remain silent about their fate, even during the Perkin Warbeck affair, when the spectre of Prince Richard reared its head to seriously threaten him. Fascinating, too, is the failure of Elizabeth of York during her nearly 20 years as Queen Consort to put her brother's fate to bed. She had been in sanctuary in 1483, but the following year rejoined the court of King Richard. If she felt constrained from speaking out at that time, why not condemn her uncle for the murders of her brothers after he was gone and she was free from his control? Surely her new husband would have welcomed any attempt she made to blame Richard. The final removal of the threat from the boys and any pretenders to their inheritance would have been appealing to Henry VII, and would also have confirmed the security of Elizabeth's own position. Perhaps the most unlikely secret keeper was Elizabeth Woodville, queen to King Edward IV and mother to the two lost boys. She spent over a year in sanctuary with her daughters, no doubt stewing on her belief that Richard stole the throne from her son. She too rejoined his court in 1484 under his protection. In itself, it is strange that she would hand not only herself but all of her remaining children over to a man who had allegedly killed her sons. Yet after 1485, she too would have been free from any threat Richard held over her, and who would have had more cause to berate the dead king for his murderous ways? She said nothing. Eventually, she was sent to Bermondsey Abbey in 1487, where she died five years later, still never having accused Richard of anything. As an aside, is it possible Henry stripped her of her lands and sent her to Bermondsey because she threatened to produce the boys and oust him? Sir James Tyrrell is the man most often held to have had the deed done for King Richard, allegedly confessing and offering names in 1502 after his arrest for treason. Examination of the historical record shows that Sir James in fact never confessed to the murder, nor was he apparently ever questioned about it. I have found a reference to Henry VII, touting the suggestion of blaming Sir James to an ambassador, but when it was not well received, he dropped the matter. This account of the boy's death seems to have first been formulated by Sir Thomas More in his infamous History of King Richard III. He may have picked up the negative image of Richard during his time in the household of John Morton, Archbishop of Canterbury, and perennial thorn in Richard III's sight, yet he too reports only rumour, gossip, and that people said Richard killed the boys. Even the architect of Richard's evil reputation could not bring himself to categorically say that he did it. It is interesting too that Moore never published his work. His nephew completed and published it after Sir Thomas's death. Did Moore never mean to condemn Richard? That is a whole other story.
The first definite, unequivocal, explicit, unambiguous finger-pointing is contained in Shakespeare's play, A Study in Evil. Even this, though, presents issues. William Shakespeare's play, The Tragedy of Richard III, is a masterpiece in the depiction of evil and the study of the psychology of the anti-hero, the villain we love to hate, to the point that we almost hope they succeed. Yet we may have been deceived by Shakespeare's play because he may not have meant us to see King Richard III in it at all. It is beyond doubt that Richard III is replete with errors of all kinds, factual, chronological and even geographical, in its efforts to damn King Richard to his audience. And it succeeds. This is the image of King Richard that has imprinted itself onto our collective consciousness, the scheming, evil murderer, worst of all murderer of children. Yet Shakespeare's genius in passing fiction into historical fact may have been an accident, or at least an unintended by-product, or convenient cover for what he was really asking his audience, and his queen, to think about. The play was written in the early 1590s, probably around 1593, and it is important to consider the context in which Shakespeare was writing. The concerns of his contemporaries were great and growing. There was still religious upheaval with no settlement reached in the country during the 60 years since Henry VIII's Reformation. Queen Elizabeth I was ageing and clearly not going to produce an heir. The question of the succession was growing like a weed, out of control, and no one was tending to it openly, including the Queen. Elizabeth ardently refused to address the issue, but it was the proverbial elephant in the room. The religion of the next monarch was a vital matter to the people of England. Transitions from Edward VI to Mary, Protestant to Catholic, and back again to Elizabeth's Protestantism, had been violent cataclysms tearing at the seams of Tudor England, and another point of uncertainty was looming. Shakespeare is widely believed to have been a devout Catholic to the end of his life, forced to hide his faith, but doubtless keen to see a Catholic monarch upon the throne after Elizabeth. He was close to his sponsors, the Earls of Essex and Southampton, who were known Catholics. If we can view Hamlet as a call to arms for English Catholics, then Richard III contains similar thinly veiled undercurrents. So who was Shakespeare aiming his quill at? I believe his audience were meant to see, and at the time would have clearly understood that they were meant to see, Robert Cecil. Robert Cecil suffered with kyphosis. He was, in the terminology of the time, a hunchback. In 1588, Motley's History of the Netherlands described Cecil as a slight, crooked, humpbacked young gentleman, dwarfish in stature, and later spoke of the massive dissimulation that was in after times to constitute a portion of his own character. Motley could almost have been describing Shakespeare's King Richard III. Robert was the son of William Cecil, Elizabeth I's lifelong advisor and Lord Privy Seal. In 1590, Robert became Secretary of State and was being groomed by his father to succeed him as the closest advisor to the monarch. After William Cecil died in 1598, Robert did succeed him as Lord Privy Seal, but as early as the beginning of the decade, when Shakespeare was writing, the Cecils were operating a covert campaign to see James Stuart, King James VI of Scotland, a Protestant, succeed Elizabeth. Read in this context, the themes and dark threats of Richard III take on a new meaning. King Richard was perhaps an obvious candidate for the representation of evil. He had lost his life and his throne at the Battle of Bosworth to Elizabeth's grandfather, King Henry VII. On the 22nd of August 1485, the monumental Plantagenet dynasty had crumbled and the Tudor Rose had flourished in the remains. Henry VII had married Richard III's niece, Elizabeth of York. As a daughter of King Edward IV, slandering this portion of the Yorkist Plantagenet family was thoroughly out of bounds. Elizabeth of York was Elizabeth I's grandmother. Richard III stood alone between Edward IV and Henry VII, with none to defend him. Henry had made great play of rescuing the country from Richard, so he was an obvious villain for a Tudor writer. The first thing to consider is the physical representation of King Richard. Shakespeare shows us a hunchback with a withered arm. While stories of King Richard having uneven shoulders existed, and Sir Thomas More had used the word crookback in his history of King Richard III, Shakespeare may have exaggerated these into the limping hunchback of his play, but Robert Cecil did, in fact, suffer from kyphosis. The withered arm seems to be a fabrication, perhaps a hint that this was not really Richard. The warnings of the play Richard III were plain to see, Richard had upturned the natural order, murdering, causing the death of his brother amongst others, until he stole the crown from his nephew, slaughtering the two young princes in the tower, and then poisoning his own wife. This upsetting of the correct way of the world had seen Richard king for a while, but had ended in disaster, with him betrayed and killed at Bosworth, and his dynasty blown to the wind. Success had been fleeting, as the Tudor dynasty was about to be. Ultimately, in the play, Richard was the architect of his own demise, and I believe that Shakespeare was offering a warning that Robert Cecil was to become the architect of the downfall of the Tudors, and that Elizabeth was allowing it to happen. The Richard of the play is an appealing villain. He's funny and clever, 
we are forced to examine our attitude to the blatant evil played out before us. We almost like him, and we're supposed to. Elizabeth I liked Robert Cecil, a man she called her little imp, and Shakespeare was warning that this veil of amiability hid dark schemes that would doom the crown. Richard is the archetypal anti-hero. In his opening soliloquy, he tells us what he is planning to do, that he is determined to prove a villain, drawing us in so that we feel like we are his co-conspirators, accessories to what follows since none of us leap up to stop him. Complacency in the face of such deeds will bring ill upon the kingdom, as will allowing Cecil the room to plot a Stuart succession. Another key theme of the play is the balance of free will against fatalism. Richard appears to be the master of his own destiny, to be driving events, giving us a Machiavellian lesson in power politics. To balance this, Richard also appears to act as though God intends the outcomes of his actions, to try and use religion to circumvent the unpleasant nature of what he does. His professed free will is an illusion, so religion becomes a central theme, man's desire for free will against God's plan. Cecil's desire for a Protestant succession versus a return to the correct religion, Catholicism. Robert Cecil is acting contrary to God's will to try and get what he wants. As Elizabeth I grew older and had no heir, the issue of the succession was a rising concern to the whole country. The last time that there had been a serious issue with the succession was following the death of Elizabeth's brother, Edward VI, but this was probably a little too close for comfort. Before that, the seizure of the throne by Richard III from his nephew Edward V had thrown the country into political convulsions that had brought about the end of a dynasty. Edward IV had died, leaving his 12-year-old son's kingdom in the care of his uncle Richard. On the basis of illegitimacy, Richard had taken the throne from his nephew. This had led to civil war, and in Tudor mythology, the need for a saviour to right the wrongs. Shakespeare was warning Elizabeth that she risked plunging the country into darkness that would lead to a violent restitution. Her duty was to ensure a smooth transition. She was failing to do this, and it was the country that would pay. Read in this context, the context in which Shakespeare's audience would have watched it, the play becomes a moral warning to Queen Elizabeth about the effects of the uncertain succession and of allowing Robert Cecil to follow his own course. Shakespeare and his Catholic sponsors were keen to see a Catholic monarch return England to what they viewed as the true religion. They certainly did not want Cecil, to whom the Earl of Essex was openly opposed at court, orchestrating the Protestant succession of a Scottish monarch. The Earls of Essex and Southampton later rebelled, trying to capture the Queen in order to force their demands upon her. Both were executed after their failure. Elizabeth never named an heir. Cecil got his Stuart succession and served James I, being elevated as Earl of Salisbury. Shakespeare became a legend. Richard III became a villain, perhaps by accident. As early as the Stuart period, Sir George Buck began to re-examine Richard III's reputation and to question the depiction that had ingrained itself in the national consciousness. The lack of hard evidence in so many areas means that the debate still rages passionately on both sides today and it is unlikely to be resolved without the emergence of new evidence. It is still worth considering, though, who actually first said that Richard III killed the princes in the Tower. No one close to the events at the time could report more than opposing, contrary rumours of the boy's fate. None at the court of the first Tudor pointed the finger, not even the prince's mother. Nothing more than rumour was reported during Henry VIII's rule by Sir Thomas More. It may have been Shakespeare over a hundred years later, but it is uncertain that condemning Richard was even the point that he hoped to make. The joy of this kind of history is that we may never know the entire truth. I may have made wild assumptions, adding two and two together to make ten, or may have just hit the nail on the head. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Richard III podcast. 